every time. You coming? I am. I misjudge it every time. Uh, hey, glad you guys are with us. Uh, we're diving in just a second to part three of this <laughs> series we're doing. Um, heads up, though, two weeks starting in March to start a brand new series called Habits that are all about how do we gain traction in some of those habits that are most meaningful in our life, like the sow and reap principles, and not just in terms of life, but spiritually. Like, how do we gain traction um, with those habits that are going to produce um, big time results later down the line? So we're going to start that in March. So we have this week and next week of It's Complicated, mm-hmm. um, and then we dive into it. So Yeah. And just real quick, um, those of you who follow me on socials, y'all know I've had pink eye and this eye. It is better, see? Um, but it moved into the other eye, and I am now on hour four or five of no meds. So there's a very good chance that halfway through this service, um, I'm going to start it's itching the crap out of these things. Okay. But also, that's why I'm not hugging anyone, and I'd prefer not to touch you today for your own self help being I whatever think, I'm looking I think for. They would so prefer not to, to be, be near touched. You as well. Yes, I know. So um, if you come up to me and I immediately stiffen, nothing against you. I'm just trying to protect you from this horrible so the whatever other night, this is. Like she wakes up in the middle of the night and she's like, ah, something's wrong with my face. And I'm, you know, I did like a double take. So I'm like, yes, there is something wrong with your face. I mean, it was <laughs> I mean, really, my, no, it's not really bad. You can, it was, really it bad. was bad. I've never had it. So, quite but here's this just a little quick like example of how two people are very different in relationship. <laughs> So like she had all these people hitting her up, texting her, like, how are you doing? I was like, how do all these people know? And then I stumble across her Instagram post where she took a picture of herself and put it up. I'm like, what is wrong with you? I would never do that in a million years. Like I would hide I'm that trying at all to stay costs, real. So. Like I'm trying not to do just the highlights. Well, like you these did. are my low valley points. Yeah. I, my eye. So, <laughs> so Thank to you. each their own, this is what makes relationships complicated. <laughs> it's two very different people. I would never do that. Um, different backgrounds, hey, um, different experiences. It. And so if you haven't been here, I'm not going to catch you up. So you go back, watch it on YouTube, listen to it. Um, but it, it's just every relationship is complicated. Mm-hmm. So in the series, we're talking about every relationship, work, friendship, um, marriage, of course, a lot that we're saying applies to that. In-laws, how to handle stuff with your siblings. I mean, all of that stuff. And one of the things that makes it most complicated is our failure to make the decision we're going to talk about today. In fact, I would say that the truth or the decision that we want to talk about today is the most important decision in uncomplicating the relationships that you're in yep. or leading those relationships to health. In fact, if you're in a relationship right now where there is conflict and you're like, I don't know the way forward, I don't know if we can get around this, probably there is conflict around the failure to make the right decision around what we're going to talk about. But mm-hmm. I get it because it's so complicated, it is so misunderstood, and if you would kind of take seriously what we're going to talk about, it really could be the thing that's going to lead you past some of those things that just look like roadblocks mm-hmm. relationally, and you just can't move past it. And here's the thing I would say. What we're going to talk about in a few minutes, I'm going to kind of tease out, that you're, you're probably actually already making this decision, and you don't know that you're making it, mm-hmm. because it never feels like a decision. It feels like a reaction. In fact, it feels like somebody else forces you into responding a certain way or doing a certain thing. And so you've never thought about the fact that you actually have a choice in the mm-hmm. matter in terms of what we're talking about. And so what I would say is, if your relationships are complicated, work, um, sibling, friendship, marriage, it's probably in part complicated because of what we're going to talk about. And if it's good, part of the reason it's good is around this area, even though you maybe have never identified it. And so mm-hmm. Where we're going to pick it up is a guy by the name of Paul that most of you know wrote like two-thirds of the New Testament. His dude's bio is amazing. He writes to a church in Corinth in the first century. And just if you don't know a guy in the backstory of Corinth, Corinth was crazy, man. Um, kind of their motto could have been what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. It was <laughs> like it was an interesting city. And so Paul had to do a lot of deconstructing for them. And so yeah. he writes to them in the context First of all, is he had to write write to them, first of all, about God and how they viewed God and operated with God, which was going to affect all their relationships. Mm -hmm. Because in the first century, they kind of served the pantheon of gods, like, you know, lowercase g. 
And it's hard for us to recognize this, but the gods in ancient history, they did not in their mind have any morality or ethics. Mm -hmm. Like the, the virtue of loving kindness as we know it, the gods did not have that in the first century. In fact, the gods didn't like people. Yeah. So their whole approach to God was, how do we appease the gods? How do we get God to be okay with us? How do we get the gods to not rain down fire <laughs> on us and grow our crops? And I mean, that's all they did. So there was constant fear because the gods just did not care about people. No morality no ethics. And so Paul comes along to go, I need to change your whole view about God mm -hmm. because Yahweh who's shown up in flesh through the person of Jesus who is God and represents God, totally different. Mm -hmm. This God loves people and treats people well, but he doesn't care about people's sacrifices. He cares about how people treat one another. Mm -hmm. And you know, we talk about this all the time. The, the New Testament ethic of Jesus was Oh, you want to love God? Go love other people. Yep. You want to be cool with God? Go be cool with other people. You, you want to do all you can to be devoted to God? Then go be devoted to relationships around you because every person you're eyeball to eyeball with is made in the image of God, the Imago Dei. And so Jesus changed the paradigm to go, I want you to love me by loving other mm. people around you. Yep. That's what it's all about. And so when Paul writes these words that you're going to read in just a second that are really familiar we've kind of lost the grittiness of them. Mm -hmm. In fact, you've heard them so many times that they've been romanticized that we, we kind of lose sight of how in the, your face they were, mm -hmm. but they were in your face. And Paul writes about great relationships and how great relationships connects to this new relationship with God through Jesus. Mm -hmm. And in this, it's so subtle, but he basically completely confronts vertical morality. Mm -hmm. And vertical morality is what many of you grew up with. It says, I checked a box, I sat in a row, I sang a song, I learned a verse, I went to Sunday school, I'm good with God, and then I can treat people however I want, and I'm still all right with God, because it's all about me and God. And God's like, no, 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 no more vertical morality. Vertical morality is born out, born out in horizontal morality, and so Paul attacks that head on to go, listen, you can't say you're spiritual mm -hmm. and treat people around you the way, you, the way that you want and still think that you're okay with God. Mm -hmm. Because the chief aim of God is to get you to love other people the way that he's loved you. And he com confronts traditional religion in terms of what many of us grew up with. And then toward the end of this that we're about to read, he comes to these four little phrases. And it's as if Paul stops and is like, man, how do I communicate this? Because it seems honestly a little naive. Some of you are going to push back and like, that's unrealistic. And I get it. Seems a little naive and a little out of place. But these four phrases are kind of the catalyst for this decision or truth that we want to talk about. Yeah. So let's take a look. Now, as soon as I say the reference, some of you are going to check out, but stay with us because I w am going to bet a lot of you have never heard these verses explained this way, okay? Which sounds kind of arrogant, but it is what it is. All right. First Corinthians 13, verse 1, it says this. If I speak in tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. So you go around, you look all flashy spiritually, you've got it all together, you, do, you have all the cool spiritual gifts, right? But you're not loving other people, then you're not okay with God, right? And so sometimes we think we can look like we have it all together, but if we're not loving other people, it's not how much you know, how much you can do. It's how well you love. Verse 2. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I'm nothing. I mean, Jesus said this. You're going to know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Verse 3, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. And this completely blows up prosperity theology, right? We give to get. I'm going to give all I have to Jesus so he can bless me. Um, but we end up gaining nothing because that's not how it works. In fact, the more you give of yourself, the more God fills you with himself and the more you experience the gospel. But this has nothing to do with money or with goods or resources. Yeah. This has everything to do with love. And then I love in verse 4. How he begins to use love, not as a feeling, but as an action, right? He says, love is patient. Then he says, love is kind. So this isn't something we feel ourselves into doing. This is something we choose to do. Because I'm going to be loving as Jesus loved me, I'm going to be patient. I'm going to give someone more time. Because I'm loving, because I'm going to love the way Jesus loved me, I'm going to be kind. I'm going to defer to the other person. Um, it says it does not envy. It's not jealous. It does not boast. It's not one-upping. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others or create regret. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. And here's the big one. It keeps no record of wrongs. <laughs> and some of you 
Um, I said first service, you're walking around with a filing cabinet, but that's too big. Some of you are walking around with a thumb drive, I right? I think like it's also old. If you still have files, filing cabinets, that's you? on you. Like, I know. Yeah, I mean. um, but some of you are walking around with a thumb drive where you have every wrong <laughs> someone who's close to you has committed on this thumb drive. Some of them are super obscure too. And the moment you get into a situation that even remotely reminds you of these things, you pull out the thumb drive. You're like, let's just see here. You plug it in and you bring up everything, some right? Some of you are very specific. You're like, remember October 4, 2003? <laughs> 13. Like it just out of nowhere it yes, comes to the yes. surface. Yeah. I don't think that has any like I, reference to us. I'm gonna have to think that one date. through later and make sure. Um okay. <laughs> um <clears throat> and last week someone got nervous about how we banter on stage. We're just very sarcastic. We love each other. We're not really fighting up here, if some of you think that, like we're just having a good time. So Maybe sometimes. I just want to be clear about that. So <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Sometimes. Never mind then. Um, verse six, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And then here's the four phrases we really want to focus on today. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. And three of those four things are dependent on us, right? They're not easy, but they're doable. We can protect, we can um, hope, and we can persevere. But some of you might be thinking like the trust thing, that's not on us, that's mm -hmm. on the other person. Yeah. Like a person is either trustworthy or they're not. I can't determine whether or not, you know, Bryant or my friend or my kid or my coworker is trustworthy. They have to determine that. But when you study the Greek word mm -hmm. for trust in these verses, the definition is actually um, always believes or believes everything. Mm -hmm. And that puts the onus back on me, right? I am going to make the choice of whether or not I'm going to believe the best, whether I'm going to believe this person has my best interest, but whether I believe what I, whether I believe. That's on me. That's no longer on them. And so it comes down to this. It comes down to a choice, a choice that we have to make every single day about whether or not we are going to believe or not yep. believe. And like everything we talk about in this series, there's an immediate like, oh, that's naive, that's crazy. Let me tell you my story. So again, I want to acknowledge, I like, get all that. We'll try to deal with that in a second. Yeah. The, the point that we want to make for a second, though, is it is a choice. Yes. Like, we feel like it's not. It just feels like a reaction and not a decision. Because again, this is based on somebody else. Because you get yeah. there to the always trust, you're like, oh, you lost me, Paul. Like, that's not, that's not even possible. And again, we start to go through all of the scenarios. But it is a decision. And again, the, the whole context is this is the marching orders for pe mm -hmm. people who are followers of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I think in our Christian culture, we get way too enamored with people who are on stages with mics attached to their head thinking that somehow knowledge equates to spirituality, somehow that giftedness equates to spirituality. It doesn't. No. In fact, the deepest person you may know spiritually mm -hmm. may know the least in mm -hmm. some cases. Mm -hmm. And that's not advocating that we shouldn't grow in the scriptures and grow in our faith. It's just the reality of it really does come down to how you love other people around you. And some of you knew people who were deep theologically. They were not spiritual. Yeah. In terms of like looking at their life. And so in that context, Paul's going, listen, this is possible. And here's how um, I would explain it. And the best way that I've heard this explained was by my mentor, Andy Stanley, years ago. And I've never forgot the language around this that I'm going to try to talk to you about. Because this really helps put this and frame this, uh, I think, for all of us. And that is in every relationship, there are expectations that we have. And we've talked some about that. But every relationship has expectations about what they're going to do, what you're not going to mm -hmm. do, what we decided on, what you promised, all of those things. And then there's what we actually experience in the relationship. Yep. And here's just the reality of living in a world where none of us are perfect. There is always a gap between the expectations we have for somebody and what we actually experience it. True? True. I mean, that's in the workplace, that's with your friend, that's with your mother-in-law, that's with your sister-in-law, that's with your kids, that's with the business partner. I mean, I don't care how legit you are, whatever the expectations are, you are going to fall short sometimes. So the whole point I'm trying to make is in every relationship, I know you're amazing, but in every relationship, there is going to be gaps between expectations and experience. And here's the deal. You have a choice of what you put in that gap when there's a gap. Yep. You choose, because it doesn't feel like it's you. You choose whether you are going to believe the best about that person or whether you're going to assume the worst. Now, I have some examples. Oh, you do? Yes. Um, and these are going to be... Once again, these are not in our notes. No, so no. I can't <clears throat> wait. So these are going to be between us, but you can really make this about anybody, right? <laughs> so about... 
Um, how, many, how long have you been married? And just so years? you know, she switches this stuff up between services. So it's <laughs> like what you get in one service is not necessarily the story you get in the second service. No. So. But we've been married 13 years. I don't even know yeah. now. Okay, so this was probably like 11. We Almost. had only been married for about two years. We, had, we didn't have any kids. And Bryant used to be, I mean, he's an incredibly hard worker, but he used to be a workaholic, like just constant, like 10, 12, 13, 14 hour days. And so um, anyway, so one Wednesday night, you were at CC Students, which then we called yeah, Velocity. Yeah, the context is we were just starting the church. Right, with no, like, it's fine. You know, I know, I'm just. You don't you need know, to defend yourself. Yeah. Like 20 people. <laughs> You know, so anytime you anytime you're starting anything, I mean, it you were the you lot. did everything you know, between yeah. the two we of us and then mom started. and dad, yeah. we I'm did everything. Okay, so you're guys. fine. I'm about to look really bad, so you can just okay. sit back and enjoy. I'm okay. gonna make myself look bad. <laughs> Anyways, um, so he went to CC students that night to Velocity, and he was supposed to be back around 8:30, and we had it planned out. He was gonna come home at 8:30. We're gonna have dinner, and then watch X Factor, which was really big at the time, and we were really into. Um, and then I think we had a couple other shows we were gonna catch up on that night with DVR because. Okay, yeah. That was pre-Netflix, Hulu, everything else. And so, anyways, so 8.30 rolls around, he's not home. 9 rolls around, he's not home, he hasn't called. I'm starting to call him, it's going straight to voicemail. Um, 9.30 rolls around, now I'm calling the church, nobody's answering at the church. I think about 9.45, I got in my car, drove up to the church, nobody's there. Um, I'm calling his father on the way home, like, I don't know where he is. I mean, I think we were this close to calling the cops. About 10, 10, 15, um, he's still not home. And now I am PO'd. I don't know what I can say on stage anymore. I'm mad, okay? Yeah. I am mad. That's and good. so I ended up watching The X Factor myself earlier that night. And I was like, you know what? He doesn't deserve any of this. And so I went on the DVR and deleted all the shows. <laughs> that was an appropriate reaction from you guys, too. Thank you. <laughs> I don't regret it still to this day because he had to learn. And when he got home, thank you. When he got home, I was like, dude, I was about to call 911. Where were you? And he was like, we finished some things up. My phone died. And I said, why didn't you call me on the church yeah, phone? Now, this, this is why he deserved for me to delete the view. He didn't have my phone number memorized. <laughs> After three years. Jeez. No, dating for a year. He did not have my number memorized. And so I was like, whatever, you know. But as we'll get to in a little bit, I have some abandonment issues just due to... <laughs> I do. I don't know why you're laughing. That's terrible. This is your segue. Anyway. Yes. <laughs> I have abandonment issues due to, like, my borderline personality disorder and other experiences I had growing up. And so, like, him, like, ghosting me and me not being... I'm like, he's dead. He left me. He ran away with someone. Like, I don't know, you know. And I'm going through all these scenarios. So clearly, I didn't fill the gap with trust. Yeah. I did not fill it with assuming the best. But And the fact that you think that was the right response, that's where we would deviate in <laughs> our application of what we're talking about. The, re All right, the rest well, of the message we agree on. Yes. Um, so to the point that I almost lost of what I was trying yes, to say, yes, I know feeling, it was. Yes. Um, expectations, experience. They weren't home when they said they were going to be home. They didn't call. They didn't memorize your number or have in your phone. I've since learned. Um, you know what? You asked, like, whatever you're saying, you, you told them to clean the room a thousand times. Um, you know, you said you were going to stay away from them. You said you weren't going to, we were going to save, and now it's the 10th Amazon package this week. Um, you know, you said you were going to pay it, and you didn't. You know, all those scenarios. I mean, go on and on. We agreed this was going to be a joint idea at work, and then you just, like, take my idea and hang me out to dry. Or we get to the table and we had already agreed on what the commission was going to be. And then you, you blindside me mm -hmm. at the last minute. And immediately, like, there, I, I'm forced into assuming the worst about you mm -hmm. because why would you? Are you serious? I can't believe, you know, or, or the whole thing of like, you said you were going to move out. And you haven't moved out yet. Like, we're still waiting. Or you were going to have my back at You're, the family yeah. dinner. Or you were, you know, all you those You were going to enroll. You were going to yeah. get help. And you haven't gotten help yet. I mean, we could, you could go on forever. Yep. And, and my point is, I, I don't care how healthy things are. Or, or, you know, what's happened in the past. Or it, when there is relationships, they're complicated. And you have ex expectations that are not always met. And you, this is the only thing I want you to hear. And if you can just check out if you don't get the rest of this. You get to choose. Mm -hmm. Whether you believe the best or whether you assume the worst, but you don't think it. You think, no, no, they chose because of what they did, because of how they responded, because of the fact that this is the seventh time in a row. And we'll get to all of that in a minute. But, but they don't. You do. Mm -hmm. 
no matter what they've done, you choose whether you are going to believe the best or whether you are going to assume the worst. But it feels like a reaction and not a decision. Mm. That's why we don't even know we're making it a lot of times. There's a, there's a book called um, One Thing You Need to Know by Marcus Buckingham. It's a few years old. I don't remember now when it, but I read it a while ago. Some of you have read it, um, I'm sure. But in the book, he um, makes uh, an illustration that actually illustrates Paul's point. And so in the book, he references a 20-year study of relationships, which by any standard, that's a long study. That's, that is lengthy and in-depth. So for 20 years, they studied great relationships. And like any study, and basically what they were looking for, what is the common denominator of all great relationships mm-hmm. as they defined it? And like any study, they had assumptions about what they thought they were going to find. And their assumption was like most of us that in great relationships, you just downgrade your view of the other person. Like you just lower the bar until like, oh, they can hit that. And then you kind of settle into the relationship, right? And you wouldn't say that out loud, but that's a lot of times how people operate. It's like, well, just we'll lower it a few more notches. Now we're good. Like, and, and now we've got things worked out. So that's what they expected. They expected that when they polled and interviewed the other person, they would, they would downgrade like virtue and character and, you know, all of these different things. Yes. And they found the complete opposite. So they would, they would and this was specifically uh, mainly marriage relationships, but they would, they would ask these really in-depth questions of one another, very lengthy. And what they found over and over and over again, and what they defined as great relationships, is that the one person over and over again would overrate in all of these qualities the other person, or I guess would score the other person higher than what they scored themselves. And then rather than just going, how low do we need to get the bar to where we can both meet this and just be okay? This is just, you know... Instead, they went the other direction. And in fact, what they found is the other person had an unrealistically positive view of the other person in the relationship. That over and over again, they really, they saw the other person better than what they actually were. So here was their findings in terms of what it created. This is what those types of relationships created. The illusion, this is going to sound funny, but just stay with me. The illusion actually created a conviction. So at the beginning, it wasn't really even true. You're, I'm not talking to you, just, Thank say, you. just so you know. Thank you for clarifying like, that for everyone. You're not actually that great, or you could just <laughs> yeah. you could turn it around. You're not actually as virtuous as I view you, or your character's not as great as I'm actually, but I'm perceiving it that way. Mm-hmm. Meaning, the other individuals just saw the best in the other person, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. almost to extreme lengths. And so the illusion actually created conviction. The conviction actually led to security. And here's why that's a big deal. Because the security fostered intimacy, because that's what happens in relationships. You, you know this already, but let's talk about marriage for just a second, but this relates in some ways to other relationships. When you really have security, like you feel secure, you feel like you can be your kind of most authentic self, there's a fearlessness that yep. eventually develops with that. Yep. Where you feel like you don't have to hold back with another person. Mm-hmm. Or you feel like you don't have to protect yourself. You don't have to be on guard. And some of you are in or have been in relationships in some context of your life where you felt that way. You're always on guard in the relationship. Mm -hmm. You're always protecting yourself. You're always waiting for the other shoe to drop. And what they found is when when individuals and couples would do this, the security actually created intimacy where they were able to just kind of open up and they didn't have to be on guard ever. And then that intimacy actually fostered love. Mm -hmm. And it all started... Because they actually saw the other person as better than what they actually were, which is really interesting. Here was the the study recommendation. Find the most generous explanation for each other's behavior and believe it. And I know immediately you're like, seriously? That's naive. You don't know him. You don't know how crazy he is. You don't know our story. You don't know the work of our... I get all that. So I'll talk about that in a second, but I'm just telling you. Like, this is the thing. They would go to ridiculous lengths. Well, you're late. There's got to be an explanation. Zebra was loosed on the highway. Like, something happened. You were high. That's actually a true story. Not mine, but somebody else's. You were hijacked. You lost your mind for a second. Something happened that I'm not aware about. Like, there's some weird, I'm sure, circumstance that caused this to happen for the third time in a row. They would go to crazy lengths. In fact, what they found was that two people in great relationships would go to ridiculous Mm -hmm. lengths to believe the best and see the best Mm -hmm. in the other person. Mm -hmm. And I get, because your maybe background we'll talk about in just a second. That, that sounds crazy to you, but I'm just going to tell you, and we'll, talk, we'll come back to you in a minute. The relationship that you want, the environment you want, the, trying to atmos- the, the kind of atmosphere you're trying to create, 
This is the only way. Mm -hmm. Now, you can choose another option, and this can seem crazy and naive, but the reality is you're actually already choosing this now. You just never identified it. Mm -hmm. You either believe the best or you assume the worst in the gap between the expectations and the experience. Yeah, and I mean, you said it, like, what we experience makes this difficult, right? So, like, you've been in relationship with this person for a while, and they're not changing. They're not listening. They're not doing anything different. It's the same old again and again and again. Or, you know, our experience make us who we are. So maybe it was how you were raised. Maybe it was a previous relationship, an ex-husband, an ex-wife, something that went wrong with the kids, um, a friend that betrayed you. Um, And so you are terrified and scared to death to truly believe the best because you think you're actually being responsible by living in fear, right? But it's so crazy. I can't remember if it's first or second Timothy, but it's one of the Timothys, one seven, um, says that fear is actually from the enemy. If you are experiencing fear in a relationship, now I'm not, I want to be clear, I'm not talking about abuse or anything like that, that there is obvious real fear. Put that aside. But in day-to-day relationships, if you're living in some kind of fear, That's from the enemy. And the enemy is trying to keep you from experiencing the abundant life we have in Christ. And a lot of that abundant life is exercised out in relationships, Mm -hmm. right? And so for me, this was really tricky just because of some of my previous relationships growing up and due to borderline personality disorder, um, I have a huge fear of abandonment. And so when we first got married, because it wasn't until we were married, you know, I think there's something like when you're dating, you get the best version of everybody. And then when you actually say, I do, and you're trapped, there's this, oh, not that we're trapped. I'm just saying, in like, healthy, I die. In a healthy way. I'm saying there's like no going back. Um, we're not trapped, babe. That came out really quickly. But, uh, <laughs> but anyways, keep talking. I'm no, I'm done now. <laughs> Woo! Um, when you're, I was gonna say stuck. Anyways, when you're when you're covenanting together, right? And yeah. and there's no like getting a break from each other. That I don't. People can no, choose 100%. to take it for the real that 100%. it is. But I'm just, right. So where's it going? I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry, second service. You just bring this stuff into a relationship. Right, and you fear. Okay, so for me, my fear of abandonment, my lack of trust started exhibiting itself towards Bryant, but it had nothing to do with him. He had never done anything to be untrustworthy. He had never abandoned me. None of that had happened in our relationship, but I was interacting with him as though he had. And it was due to previous relationships that had hurt me badly. And so I thought I was doing the responsible thing by he's going to have to earn my trust. He's going to have to prove it. And in a second, you're going to talk about how that, that suspicion actually makes us do weird yeah. and crazy things. But I had to start learning what my triggers were, right? Like, what were those things that would make me start to fear, that would make me start to question or second guess? And then I had to get into therapy, honestly, to learn how to rewire my brain. See, our brains develop coping mechanisms to keep us alive and keep us safe in certain situations. And we can be thankful for our bodies for doing that. But if we're living that way for 20 plus years, that's when it becomes dangerous, right? Those coping mechanisms are only supposed to be in place to get you out of the situation. Once you're out, you have to heal your brain to know how to function properly, healthily, normally. And so one of the really cool things he did for me, and I know a lot of people who do this with um, their kids, right? Um, I did this with one of our family members, which was I went to therapy with them, right? You go to therapy with them because that way you can learn basically how their brain is functioning functioning unhealthily, and then you can learn how to help their brain begin to focus function healthily, right? And so that's what he would do. I'd go once by myself, he'd come once with me. So that when we were in these moments where I was really struggling um, because he stepped on a trigger on accident, hadn't done anything wrong, just stepped on a trigger, he was able to help me work through that fear and get to the other side of it. And so it didn't create um, unnecessary friction in our marriage. Um, And so that's just something I'd really encourage a lot of you. If you've come from a really difficult you know, previous relationship or childhood or whatever the case may be, please make sure you're getting into therapy so that your brain can begin to heal so it doesn't constantly get tripped up by triggers and you're not taking your pain out on someone else, you know? And then if you're in relationship with someone who had a difficult childhood or had a difficult, like maybe consider 
going to therapy with them, okay? Going to therapy, sometimes even if your kids would allow it. I mean, how cool would it be if you were like, hey, I want to go with you, not so like I can hear everything you're saying, but just so I can learn. I want to learn because I know you're struggling. I want to learn with you. It's just a really cool yeah. thing to do. Yeah. And on the negative, kind of negative side of that, I think the thing, because again, we immediately go to that's naive, you don't know our mm. story, and I get that. But I think the thing that we just have to consider is this. There is nothing to be gained by not trusting. Yeah. And, and if you could just get your head around that one point, it may change everything. So I don't, you know, go out, don't do anything. Don't change anything. That's fine. But at least start to renew your mind with this truth. There's nothing to be gained by not trusting because reality is suspicion is an expression yeah. of rejection yeah. in relationships. Yeah. And we've been created as acceptance magnets. Like we are drawn to environments and people where we are accepted. And what happens in relationships where one person is constantly kind of putting in that gap by assuming the worst, what happens is they start to be suspicious and then the other person in the relationship, even if they're really, maybe, maybe they've messed up, they're, tr they're trying to get some things right, they're trying to be trustworthy, and yet in the dynamic of the relationship, because the other person is constantly suspicious, they're measuring every word. Mm -hmm. They're paying attention to every way they say things, how they react, how they interact. What, and they actually appear to be up to something <laughs> yeah. even when they're not. Yeah. That's what environments like that create. And that could be a work environment. That could be a family environment. But they appear to be up to something. And in a sense, you can set somebody up in another relationship based off of your suspicion where you actually set the stage for the very thing that you fear. Yep. And the thing that I would say is, to your point, Pay attention to who you are, meaning what has your past created in terms of fear and insecurity and behaviors? And that, many of those things were not your fault, but you react out of that. My, my case was different where I, there was a lot of reasons that made it easy for me to trust. And so you got two people who are coming from very different pl places. You have to know who you are and kind of settle in because it's easy to just focus on what they said and what they did. Now, mm -hmm. if you're going, well, you, you just come constantly ignore it. They haven't come through for 14 times. No. When you can't trust any longer, you need to confront. Mm -hmm. You need to have a conversation. You need to talk to somebody. I mean, it is naive to go like, they've never come through on a promise and I'm just gonna ignore it for the rest of my life. That's not healthy. Yeah. And I'm not talking about abuse. And obviously there are extreme situations where a relationship just needs to be severed. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking about the other 90% to where if you were like, when that thing isn't me meshing up rather than just moving to assuming the worst, which is what we generally do, you decide to believe the best. And even when you have to confront and have a conversation, let me just give you kind of this pointer. Come into the conversation with, I yes. want to trust you. Yes. Rather than just, you did it again. I can't believe you. This is the seventh time in a row. I knew you were going to. That immediately shuts down the relationship when yeah. you start to get the thumb drive out of the last 13 years. <laughs> so come into the conversation with, even if we have to have a, a kind of a conversation because it's been four times in a row. Mm -hmm. But I just want you to know, I want to trust you. But we need to talk about this. That cracks the door open to that relationship. Yeah, that's so good. That's so good. So I just want us to look one more time just at these last few verses, just as we land the plane now that in light of everything we've talked about, starting in verse 6, love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. In other words, love isn't trying to catch the other person, trying to do something wrong. It's not building a case. It's not keeping score of the past. In fact, actually what love does is love destroys that thumb drive. Love throws it out. Love gets it out of the conversation. It doesn't bring it up again. Love always protects from suspicion, from fear. It always trusts, believes the best, chooses the most generous explanation, always hopes, and it trends positive. And then I love this. It always perseveres. And this is Paul being realistic. Paul is saying, listen, there are going to be glitches. There are going to be problems. There, is going, there are going to be times when you are fearful. But you have to persevere through that fear. And I love that rhymes. And we should that put good. that on the screen. Right, yeah. Persevere through that fear. That was good. What I love is perseverance. And you mentioned this. So I'm going to steal this from you. Is, yeah. is like a muscle. Yeah. And we have to exercise and build it. And I remember... One of the things that we would do early on in our marriage was um, when I would have irrational fears, when I would start to face my triggers, when I would start to feel abandonment creeping in, um, because we were both going to therapy together and he was kind of learning that 
there were times where my brain would just go there without me even trying. It was just an automatic response. And it would be very difficult for me to come to rationally, right? And so we would have to wait a little bit. But one of the things we learned is that I would just come to him and I would take the burden on me, right? Like, listen, like I'm struggling here. This is my fear of abandonment. This is my trigger. But I need you to help me see the truth in this because all I can see right now is the fear. Mm -hmm. I feel like you may be leaving. I feel like you may be hurt. I'm not sure what I'm feeling. I'm just sad and I'm scared. Please help me see the truth. And he would. We would sit down together and he would help me see the truth. And then I would have to make a choice where I would either lean in and trust the person got a place in my life, or I was going to continue to live out of my irrationality. And those first few decisions were really hard for me um, because I did. I felt like I was being irresponsible. I felt like I needed to listen to the fear, that the fear was a good warning sign. But I started leaning into trust. And the more I did that, the easier it became. And the less and less I was getting tripped up by the triggers, the less and less I was having downward spirals. And this happened, and I've talked very openly about my relationship with my parents, how that's been an up and down thing. In the past several years, as we've developed a really healthy relationship, I've had to do this with them too. Like, hey, you doing that or saying this, that brings up some old stuff for me, and it's difficult, and I just need us to talk through this because you're not meaning to hurt me, but you are. Can we just have a conversation around this? I've had to do this with friends. Um, where I've just let them know like, hey, I'm going through a season where I'm exhausted. A lot of times it happens for me when I'm tired, right? I'm exhausted, I'm drained, I'm feeling very insecure. This happened or this happened. Can you help me understand? Because I know you're not meaning to hurt me. It's how I'm filtering through this and so I just need you to help me. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna tell you, when you humbly come to someone and you explain it that way, it actually takes your relationship even deeper and it makes it even stronger yeah. because you are communicating, you're being vulnerable first of all, saying, hey listen, this is a me problem. Here's some of what I'm struggling with. And then you're also giving them, like Bryant said, the open door to be able to walk through this with you. You're not isolating yourself. See, when we get hurt, a lot of times we isolate ourselves, we pull back, we, and we create suspicion because we all of a sudden just cut the relationship off without any kind of explanation, leaving the other person wondering what they did when they did nothing, right? So these conversations are so important, but it is a choice it is a choice to enter into these conversations. And, and we said it this way in our notes, and this is how you know whether or not you're winning the war with fear. Are you always assuming the worst or are you believing the best? In every situation, is your first inclination to assume the worst? Now, I realize, and I said this last service too, like there are some of you that are just natural Eeyores, okay? And we love you. I don't know how to relate to you, but we love you, okay? <laughs> Um, you are natural. My sister is an Eeyore, and she said that. She is, and this is not going to be anything she doesn't know, but she's an Eeyore. And um, so your first inclination sometimes is to go straight towards the negative, okay? That's just the way you're wired. And so don't be discouraged by that. But as you jump to that negative, be like, whoops, you know, let me try to think of a positive here and redirect your brain, redirect your mind, and just come up with crazy, awesome scenarios that could be positive things as to why this person did what they did, right? It could even be fun. But the, op, the, the only other choice you have, if you're not going to believe the best, the only other choice you have is this. You're going to delight in uncovering mistakes, which is going to make you miserable. You're going to thrive on speculation, which is going to make you exhausted because constantly speculating, it does, it exhausts you. You're going to assume the worst, which is absolutely draining, or you're going to embrace doubt and you're going to be consumed. And that does not sound fun to me at all. I would much rather believe the best. And I want to say this, the only way you're going to be able to believe the best, and we've been saying this every week, is if you center your identity in Jesus Christ. See, if your identity is in your relationships, then yes, every time that relationship goes off the rails and people find out and all of it gets out and yada, 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 you're going, to, you're going to delight in uncovering mistakes. You're going to thrive on speculation. You're going to assume the worst. You're going to embrace the doubt. You're going to be totally consumed in that world. But if your identity is built on Jesus Christ and the fact that he loved you and he gave his life and he forgives you, and if your identity is built on Jesus Christ, then you, these relationships, if they mess up, if something goes wrong, they're not going to rock you to your core like they once did. You're going to have a stability because what they do to you doesn't define you. Who, how Jesus loves you and what Jesus Christ has done for you will end up defining you. And so you have to decide. Now, here's what I would say. 
it sounds really intimidating to just decide once and for all. And you're not going to be able to decide once and for all. So I want to challenge you this. Can you decide till the end of today? <laughs> just start there. That anytime you get into a situation where someone upsets you or frustrates you or hurts you, even today, your kids annoy you, your husband does something, whatever, you, in, that, in that moment, you decide to assume the best or believe the best. And then tomorrow morning, you wake up and you're like, I'm just going to make it to lunch, believe in the best. And then I'm going to make it to dinner. Set small little goals for yourself. But after two or three days of this, I want you to take some inventory. How do you feel? Do you feel more energized? Do you feel happier? Do you feel more secure in your relationships? How do you feel? Because I can guarantee you that if you choose to do this and you do it correctly, you will feel a hundred times better than you do right now. And sorry, not everything is going to be, not everything is going to be perfect, right? This isn't going to fix your relationships. All right. But what it's going to, it's going to do something in you. And that's what we're talking about. 100%. Okay, I'm done now. I think you 100%. got the rest of the service. So yeah, well, take it away. I'll land the plane. But I, well, all I was going to say, is, and if nothing else, to paint a realistic picture, initially it may only do the the work of like just unearthing what direction you lean. Where it's mm. like, dang it, I'm negative all the time. <laughs> I believe the worst. It, I'm a but, Eeyore. But that's healthy to know this is maybe some of what I'm doing. And here's the thing is, it's not all irrational. Like in some cases, you have really good reason to not trust, really mm-hmm. good reason to be fearful. Mm-hmm. And when you can't, you confront. But again, I'm going to go back to, even in that, to start that conversation with, I want to trust you. And yeah. all I would say is the majority of human beings, not all of them, there's some extreme cases, maybe you're in relationship with one, but the majority of people, when they hear, I want to trust you, guess, guess how their soul responds? Yeah. I want to be trustworthy. Yes. And so... There may be issues that have to be confronted, and then there may be a point where you've confronted the point where nothing's changes, changed and we've got to move on. But the whole point is still, you get to decide and choose yes. whether you're going to assume the worst or believe the best. And if you would go first to believe the best, you may change the trajectory of that mm-hmm. relationship. Mm-hmm. Somebody going first may change everything because I've seen this enough times to know it can completely alter the disposition of another person when somebody decides this is how I'm going to move forward and all of a sudden it starts to crack the door in a relationship that you thought was over a long time ago because again trust equals acceptance your heart is drawn to that your behavior is drawn to that your heart your soul is drawn to that and I mean think about it the people that you want to let down the least are the people that you respect the most And when you decide to create this kind of atmosphere, wherever it is, it's a game changer. People are drawn to that. You will be amazed at how people will raise their level of behavior. You didn't even think they had it in them Mm. because of the fact that you start to believe differently about them. And if you're not a Jesus follower, I'm not sure what the way forward is for you, but this stuff applies regardless. And my hope would be that you would start to apply Jesus' teaching and maybe you would end up at the place that was unexpected to you to realize that this guy who you thought was just a good teacher is actually Lord and Savior. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> That he actually rose from the dead that yeah. validated everything that he said. Yep. And that he's worthy of following. Because here's the thing. Let's just, just real practical. The quickest way to discover if someone can be trusted is to trust them. Mm-hmm. It's your best option. Flip side, the quickest way to turn someone who is trustworthy into someone who is not is to not trust them. It's your best option. It is is your only option. And you are already deciding. For some of you, you just didn't know you were deciding. Yeah. And you get the choice to decide, am I going to assume the best or am I going to believe the worst and watch what God does? And listen, for some of you, again, again, I know there's a history But in some cases, not all, you're in a relationship with somebody or you're in an environment or atmosphere in a culture and they've been trying to kill it for a while and you just don't see it. And it started as kind of a a lack of trustworthiness on their part. But now you've kind of taken the baton and are sabotaging the relationship for something that happened four years ago or 14 years ago or 18 years ago. And what if you, and I'm just going to leave you with this, What if you, in this context, decided to take Jesus seriously, Jesus' advice seriously when he said this, do unto others as you would have them do unto you? And as a follower of Jesus, let me just speak to you for a second. 
This is a game changer. Again, quote a mentor of mine. When you decide to follow Jesus, he has not promised you that every relationship is going to work out. He has not promised you pain-free, problem-free. Paul actually wrote the opposite. Yeah. Prosperity theology is obliterated as soon as you read Corinthians. Anytime you are looking to get something from God, you get the opposite. <laughs> Instead, God has invited you into relationship with him. And the prize is you get Jesus. Yeah. And following Jesus will make your life better, and following Jesus will make you better at life. And more than, more, maybe more importantly in this context, following Jesus will make you better at relationship mm. because you will live and you will relate in a less, less self-centered world. Because I'm just telling you by experience, when you really encounter Jesus and start to follow Jesus, you can't help but have your behavior and relationships mm -hmm. transformed. Mm. And suddenly, I want to put her hopes, her dreams, and her desires ahead of me. And it is not always perfect, and I don't always feel like it. But that's exactly what my Savior's done for me. He lowered or he let go of the expectations before I ever did anything and decided to move to my side and to do something on my behalf. Basically, you, you decide that I'm going to extend to them, not what they deserve, not what they're worthy of. I'm going to extend to them exactly what I wish would be extended to me. Yep. It's a picture of our relationship with our Savior who came and he did for you mm -hmm. exactly what you needed the most and exactly what you deserve the least. And just so you know, when you sign up to follow Jesus, that's the invitation of Jesus. I want you to do for them exactly what I've done for you. That's what it means to follow me. And all cards on the table, listen, I hope that your relationships are uncomplicated. I mean, we've been praying that this entire series that this is helpful, that God leads you to a place of restoration and reconciliation and wholeness. I hope more than that, that you begin or re-begin a relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Because the reality is, I love the relationships that God's put in my life. I love my relationship with my wife. We've walked in a decade of extraordinary trust because of what Jesus has done. But more than anything, regardless of what happens in my relationships, I get Jesus. Yeah. And following Jesus, whether it's hard for you to believe or not, it is better than everything else. And my hope is that you would come to the place to believe. He actually came in human flesh and lived a perfect life that I couldn't. And he died on my behalf for all of my sin, past, present, and future. And so it's two broken people coming into a relationship with baggage, which we're going to talk about next week. What do you do with your baggage? And I think the only way to move forward is to recognize this is exactly what Jesus has done for me. I want to extend that to them. And the moment you place your faith and trust in Jesus and you understand Jesus' love for you, I think it's the catalyst yeah. for extending trust and love to another person in a human relationship. Yeah. And so as we close, can I just pray over you real quick and, and just, just pray over kind of this, this decision and this dynamic and that if you're not a follower of Jesus, like you can pick and choose and you can keep coming. And I love that you're here, that you're watching, you're listening on radio. But my hope is that maybe you would come to the place to believe that Jesus really is God. And I want to begin a relationship with him. So can I just lead you in a prayer that does not save you, but it's just your declaration of trust in your heart and mind to say this, Jesus. I believe that you're God. I believe that you lived the perfect life that I couldn't. And I believe that you died on the cross for my sin, all of it, past, present, and the future sin I haven't even gotten to yet. And that I believe in history, you rose from the dead. And I'm not trusting me. I'm trusting what you've done for me. Jesus, forgive me. And I'm telling you, that decision may be the catalyst for extending the trust and the love that you've been trying to extend in the human relationships in your life. And then for others of you that are just, maybe just struggling right now to trust, and there's good reasons for it. Or maybe there's other cases where you're just struggling to trust because you brought some stuff into that environment, into that workplace, into that friendship, into that relationship. And you just need Jesus to set you free with nobody looking around. If that's maybe you, and you just need the power of God to begin to make the decision to believe the best, and if you can't choose to confront in an appropriate way, we just lift up your hand to go, and just in a general sense, I need prayer, and I need the power of God to help me in this area of my life. Just lift up your hand. If that's you, just lift up your hand in this moment. Jesus, I just pray for those who are physically making a declaration of I need you, which I think there's something powerful about that. I pray that you would invade, you would move in their circumstances, give them what they don't have on their own. 
I pray that you would bestow upon them your trust and your love to flow through them and to the relationships in their life. And I pray even this moment that maybe this would be a catalyst for some for the redemption and the reconciliation that they've been praying for in relationships. And we pray all of this in Jesus' incredible name. Amen.